And our speaker today is Joe Tomendel. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but excuse me if I didn't, Joe. And he's going to be talking about managed grazing. And then let me just tell you also that on Wednesday, October 12th, he's going to be joining us again. And he's going to be talking about his, the Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship Program, um, which is a great opportunity for farmers starting out. So maybe he'll talk about that a little bit today. But um, mainly he's going to be talking about managed grazing. So, Joe, are you ready out there? I'm ready. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. Okay, let's get going. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Uh, great having me here today. You know, I, I appreciate the invite. Uh, my name is Joe Tamandel. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship Program, uh, which is a first in the nation formal training program for the next generation of farmers and the next generation of farmers, uh, more specifically using managed grazing uh, and organic type of practices. You know, for a variety of reasons, from economic uh, to environmental type of reasons for to just plain the logistics of getting uh, new individuals into, into dairying. Uh, but that's something we'll talk about a little bit more as we go on, specifically more in the next webinar in a month. I'm also a dairy farmer, uh, so it's kind of fun doing a presentation like this uh, because I do get to use some, you know, slides from my farm and, uh, and you know, kind of reflect on some of uh, the day-to-day -day things that go on on the farm. Uh, my wife and I have uh, two separate 150 cow uh, grazing dairies in Taylor and Marathon County uh, that we operate. Um, so, uh, so farming and you know water and environment is a definitely a very important thing to us. And I was invited today to talk and kind of address these issues of water and agriculture's impacts on water and talk a little bit about agriculture um, and and where we're at and how we got to where we're at today. Uh, so I'm going to just start off with, you know, just kind of a real quick history on how we got here, more specifically within the dairy sector of agriculture. And I'm going to do just kind of a quick overview of the last 60 years in ag, uh, specifically dairy, and how we've progressed and, and created this very successful dairy industry, which feeds an incredible amount of people uh, very cheaply and has really done a good job bringing new technology into the dairy system um, so that we can be more efficient uh, and more productive. So when you look back, you know, oh, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, I, you know, I always kind of like to look back at some of these old advertisements and that, and this is kind of a bit of a romantic view on how a lot of us view the old farm and our grandparents' farm and, and some of the equipment um, and some of the technologies, you know, the technologies that have been developed in dairy have obviously really impacted the progression of dairy and, and what it looks like today. And we've always been brought back into, um, you know, kind of these technologies because they're cool. Uh, they're, they're interesting. It's fun to be involved in. And you could see some of the harvesting equipment that we have back then to even the way that we're milking. It's, it's hand milking. You know, there are cats right now in the barn with you. Uh, and it was a nice environment, and, and that's where we kind of got going. Uh, technology changed. You know, we got more productive. We've got more efficient. You know, people started ha having more of their own equipment. Uh, it became bigger, so we could handle more acreages, make more feed for our cows. Therefore, our, our herds could expand. Uh, equipment in the 80s started to continually get bigger. Uh, milking systems got big, uh, more efficient. We got the pipelines and, and some of the early on parlors and milking systems, and and uh, it just became our capacity became larger and larger uh, to produce more milk on one location with fewer people and and become more efficient. And this is just kind of how agriculture and dairy has progressed, and and this is common in other sectors too. Uh, then we get into the 90s and and early 2000s, and we've become, you know, even more efficient with technology. Uh, it's allowing us to bring more and more animals onto, you know, one farm, and allowing us to, you know, increase our yields and change the types of forages and and feeds that we're feeding cows. We're able to bring in different commodities and store them, uh, and and more efficiently utilize uh, more acres of land and grow more tons of feed on it. And in many cases, the way we're able to 
you know, grow more tons of feed is we were able to figure out how to feed cows a little bit differently. And we focused a little bit more to a, a corn silage based diet and, and and more of a row crop and corn and beans and and we're able to be very, very productive out of it and, and very successful. And as you see, things continue to change and they get bigger and bigger equipment and and it's just it, people like to be around it uh, in the industry. You know, this is as a as a farm kid growing up and as people going to college and that and they like to be, you know, surrounded by large, these amazing things, these new technologies, these big type of large scale impressive operations. And and it's allowed us to go from that thirty cow barn or fifteen cows hand milking with, with a calf next to you uh, to five, six, eight thousand, ten thousand cow dairies that produce milk incredibly efficient, that rely on land that is growing hundreds of tons of corn silage and commodities to bring in in a, in a bit more of a concentrated form around uh, these uh, these newer farms and our milking systems uh, and systems have even gotten a lot more advanced we're looking at a lot more technology where we can really take each cow as we're milking it we can identify all of her statistics as far as her number her whole um, basically her history, how much milk she's given, what's the temperature of the milk, what's the cell count of it. And we can just collect an incredible amount of information uh, and we've become more and more automated as a result with robotic calf feeding and, and milking and even robots that'll push up feed. Uh, so it's, it's a very, uh, you know, an interesting industry and it's a very successful industry as we move forward and that's kind of where and what has brought us to this level. Uh, so as a result, if we take a look at the consolidation of our dairy industry, if we look back in the 40s, um, you know, we had, um, you know, a lot of farms. Uh, I mean, there were 160,000 farms at one time, uh, and the average herd size was, oh, there was under that 25 cows. Uh, and, but then as we moved on and as we progressed and as our technology got better, uh, by the time we hit 2012, you know, we're looking at, you know, a considerably smaller number of farms. In fact, in Wisconsin, we're under 10,000 now. Um, and we're looking at an average herd size of, high size of, you know, pushing that, you know, 225 plus uh, for average herd size and many of which are considerably larger. One of the other things that has allowed us to do this uh, is our advanced technology in corn yields. If we look back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, you know, corn was there. It was a crop. It was used, you know, for some animal feed. Um, and, you know, it had a lot of potential. Through technology, through an intensive research, and through resources put toward it, uh, we've been able to take that production of corn and, and triple it. Uh, you know, over the past few years. Since 19, from the 1970s, we over doubled our average yield per acre of corn, uh, which is also a technology that's allowed us to put more cows on one spot, uh, which is, um, which allows us to create, you know, uh, a food cheaper uh, and allows the dairy industry to look the way it does. So let's talk about this. This has been a, a critical piece, and it's the corn-based feeding system in the dairy industry. So we've really gone a shift from this forage-based to corn and soy-based. We've got some new support industries that were developed. I mean, that's how we get a $26 billion industry in the state. Um, we've got, as a result, we've got a bit of a, of a get-big type of a mindset uh, within agriculture and within dairy. You know, land-grant universities, are, it's easy to prepare youth uh, for new careers in ag when it comes to anything from you know agronomist uh, to people working in sales uh, in specifically in cattle nutrition you know with a larger industry and a larger confined industry people can specialize in pieces of a dairy they don't have to know the whole thing in general and 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 that's what is easier to actually train and create out of post-secondary type of institutions. Um, with fewer producers to meet these demands, 
Uh, consignment operations expanded and they increased cows on a single site. We've got a bit more of a, of a factory model in a way, and we learned a lot from industry. So while it is a very successful industry, um, and you know we lend, we've learned a lot from it, a lot of science and research has come out of it, and we've become more efficient. There are some unintended consequences, and these are things that we didn't really see as we're developing this very successful industry. Uh, and some of these un unintended consequences come a lot from a, a monocropping uh, type of a feeding system with the cows, and, it, and it's based on corn. And we're having a, because our soil is tilled so frequently, uh, because it is left exposed, we're seeing a lot of soil loss and degradation from it. We're seeing nutrient chemical runoff. Uh, some contamination of ground and surface water, uh, greenhouse gas and ammonia emissions, loss of wildlife habitat, and pollinators, decrease in plant biodiversity, uh, loss in the integrity of landscapes and, and, and our, our rural communities. There are fewer businesses in it. Granted, there are jobs, but there's fewer independent businesses. Uh, so it's all things that we need to, to look at and figure out, okay, what kind of technologies or what tools does agriculture have that can help counter that or, or can help soften those edges? Uh, so major concerns in water quality. And that's, that's some things that we'll discuss a little bit more here today. And, and not pointing fingers, it, it's a reality of this, this industry that we've created. And it's a reality that we need to be responsible with. And we need to responsibly look at uh, as a result of the way you know our dairy is going and our agriculture is going, we're having some serious soil erosion issues, wind and water erosion, exposed soil, annual tillage. Um, we're having more extreme weather events, uh, just and and a lot of it are these incredible rainfalls that we're seeing now. Whether it's happened back in history or or whether it's a new thing, you know that's up to you know people have different opinions on that. But the reality is they're happening. And when you get a one or two inch rainfall in an hour or two on exposed soil, it's very difficult to find a mechanical technology that's going to hold that soil there. So we need to keep some of these things in mind. Phosphorus and nitrogen, soil bound uh, nutrients, and specifically phosphorus. When you start getting your soil erosion, most of us know that that soil uh, is containing that phosphorus molecule, and, and that's where a lot of our phosphorus is heading down into our surface water. You know, nitrogen uh, is something that if there is a nitrogen overload, whether it's from commercial fertilizer or a uh, natural based or manure uh, on soil, that's where we can have the leaching into the groundwater. And we are seeing some of those things happening out there. Uh, so as a result, you know, if we take a look at you know, some of just plain the statistics that are out there, and these are just a, a Google search on slides that are out there about the dairy industry and, and agriculture in general and its you know, impact on our environment. And let's take a look at this dead zone and this hypoxic zone basically in the oceans and the Gulf of Mexico. And you can kind of take a look at the farms in the cities that are along this floodplain uh, and you know where this phosphorus is coming from. This gives a pretty good view of what this um, this watershed looks like and, and who and what is impacting it. Uh, here's another thing we found just on the um, right up in Kiwani County and the Bay of Green Bay and that whole Fox Valley watershed. Uh, and there, you know, there's uh, research and reports coming out about Kiwani County, how there, there's 14 CAFOs uh, and the amount of uh, manure that is created up there as a result. You know, these, these beef and cattle CAFOs are producing enough waste that's equivalent to 924,000 humans. And this was a study done in 2014. Uh, Brown County, similarly, in the uh, Fox River, uh, home to 105,000 cows, uh, you know, put into this area. It's it's unfortunate that these operations are in such a sensitive area. This is maybe some of the more sensitive areas uh, in our state, right around that Bay of Green Bay, and that is some of the most confined uh, operations that we have. Also, uh, so these are just some some things that are out there. Here's another article that was brought out in 2015. And when we look at the karst topography in Kiwani County, 
uh, and the amount of animals, the amount of manure uh, that is there, uh, we just simply have a nutrient, uh, an excess of nutrients. We've got more nutrients there than what crops would need. Uh, so that's where we're starting to get reports and actual contamination within our groundwater. Uh, these are real things that we need to be realistic about. We need to be fearless as we're looking at our water supply, which is so incredibly important and our really basic natural resource, and trying to find these solutions. Another uh, study and some data that was out there uh, basically shows where a lot of this phosphorus loading is coming from. This is a lower Fox River basin, and it's, uh, it's industrial. There's municipal waste. Uh, and then there's agriculture right there also, and it's a lot of it is from soil loss. So we're we're seeing how soil loss is, and these are physical pictures. The most all of us have seen this. I think this is the this is the fox or the duck coming into the Bay of Green Bay, and after either the this looks like it's after uh, the the snowmelt in the spring, and that's the other thing. If we even if we don't have these significant rig balls. Every year we've got a snow melt, and that's going to be a significant amount of water coming off of a lot of land uh, very quickly. So let's take a look at what, what are our tools out there that agriculture has. We're a very innovative industry. What are our tools that we have that can be a solution? We're not just looking at Band-Aids. How can we fix this and be realistic about it? Um, in recent decades, we've looked at and looked for solutions. and you know, we've targeted a variety of different things, such as targeting nutrient applications, and we're able to do that with technology, uh, with applied nutrient technology. We've looked at no-till planting, at cover crops, buffer zones, nutrient management plans. These are all great measures, uh, uh, but it's still very difficult uh, to be a complete solution and to keep all the phosphorus that we need to keep out of our groundwater uh, and the nitrogen, excuse me, all the phosphorus out of our um, surface water and the nitrogen out of our groundwater. Let's take a look at managed grazing as a tool. This could very well be our solution. You know, let's really think about this. Managed grazing can build healthy soils and keep them in place. It can improve this filtration and protect our water quality. Uh, it makes use of a real diverse set of forages. Uh, which will increase the biodiversity. It can restore habitat for wildlife and pollinators, improve health and longevity of livestock. Uh, it can result in high quality products for new and emerging markets from an economic standpoint. It, uh, it can enhance the aesthetic appeal of a rural landscape. Uh, when we look at calendars and, and tourism uh, type of promotions for northern Wisconsin, Wisconsin in general, uh, cows outside red barns sell. Uh, that's just, it's a reality. Uh, it can support vital rural economies. We're looking at having maybe a few more businesses. You know, still, yeah, there's jobs, but let's look at businesses, and can it create more businesses? So let's talk a little bit about this whole managed grazing, and many of us have a pretty good um, handle on it, and we're going to kind of review it and, and talk a little bit more about how can this be the tool in agriculture's toolbox that can really be a solution. and and managed grazing in general, and we'll make some comparisons through here also, of, of managed grazing versus a continuous grazing. And this graph is a bit of, a, of an idea to show you. When you look at the left, and that's just say it's a 100-acre field, you know, continuous grazing means you throw the cows out there and you leave them there. You may leave them there for the summer. You may leave them there for June. You may leave them there for July. The reality is that's not real grazing. This isn't the type of a solution that we're talking about. We're talking about a much more intensive type of an animal rotation where this is broken up into many different sectors and that cows are actually moved 12 hours to you know every day or two uh, off of one paddock onto the next. It allows the paddock to rest, regrow, it allows different stages of growth, it allows different types of um, uh, legumes and grasses to take over and it increases the productivity of the pasture. Uh, incredibly, you know, exponentially. Uh, so uh, grazing rotation, for example, you know, pasture divided into different paddocks. Herds are rotated through a period of paddocks, like say one to three days. You know, a lot of the, uh, the dairy guys, it's every 12 hours. That's just the reality of it, to get, you know, the good production from animals and get the productivity off these paddocks. That's how frequently they're getting moved. Um, and it's something that is 
is a very logical thing to do. You know, we've got systems that can allow this to happen uh, very easily and and move cows quickly. So let's take a look at another way to look at, at managed grazing. And this is where these some of my cows, this is actually right after, and you'll see another picture of this, right after um, and during a, uh, a one and a half inch rain event in about an hour. Uh, these are cows that are, you know, just out on, it's a fairly flat piece of ground, uh, but they're out uh, grazing on one of the paddocks. This paddock itself you, is, uh, it's not one of the best ones, but it's a pretty good one, but this hasn't been tilled in about 14 years right now. Uh, so it's got a, a pretty good diversity of plants on it. So let's talk about explain managed grazing uh, from another little bit of a standpoint. And this is another picture of my farm in the background you can see. Uh, and so my wife and I bought our farm, 80 acre farm in 1998, just for a short time. And we cashed in our whole retirement, uh, which was not huge, but we bought a farm. Uh, it was just a very modest farm. Uh, managed grazing is what allowed us to get and invest an incredible amount of money uh, into buildings and equipment and things that most uh, and appreciate. So we're able to invest more money into dairy cattle, which will appreciate. Uh, so when we look. If we would have done this the way we were taught in college, uh, we could have gone into this. We would have uh, started in the spring. We would have had to custom hire somebody to come in and plow that land. Uh, they would have dissed it once or twice, dragged it, uh, seeded it, uh, cultipacked it, and rolled the, rolled the seed in, probably oats and a cover crop. Uh, we then would have waited. We would have to, you know, while the soil is exposed, we would have waited. Uh, until the the cover crop and the oats grew would even take either taken the oats off or let's just say we would have cut the oats off as a crop so we would have hired somebody to come in cut it merge it harvest it haul it around the block it's about three miles by the road over to the farm put it in a bunker or the silo itself or somehow store it uh, we would have then taken that feed fed it to our cows in a barn uh, and then taken the manure and hauled it back around here to this field. So that was one way we could have done it. Uh, that was tough to swallow you know, just from an affordability standpoint to hire all these custom people up front. Uh, so we looked at it and said, all right, you know, cows have feet. Uh, this grass is going to stay here. Uh, we've got the means to do this. Why don't we send the cows to this grass? And that's what we did. So this is a way to look at it. So by sending the cows to the grass, we're going we're gonna to send them out to that field. They'll follow their poly wire. You can see it in the back. Uh, they were still moved every 12 hours. And as a result, we eliminated basically all those costs that I listed in regards to tillage, uh, harvest, storing, and hauling of manure back out to this piece and basically harvested it with the cows. They did all of it for us, and they left the manure there. Uh, so this is one way to explain the economics and the logic of grazing and how it can work. And some of the tools that we use are simple. It's a roll of poly wire. It's an electrified roll of basically string that has ends of uh, stainless steel wire in it that will carry uh, an, an electrical. Uh, the things that have allowed us to do this, why this isn't the, the grazing of the 50s and 60s, uh, this is one of the reasons. And then there's been an, an, an advent of... Um, better sensors that are out there. There are a lot of the stuff that imported from New Zealand who does a lot of grazing uh, and has had a lot of time you know, with research and, and developing this industry. Uh, this has come in uh, from there and, and we've got the advent of, uh, of, uh, uh, of sensors uh, that are a lot better. Actually, they don't shred all this as well. We're actually able to charge a lot more fence, a lot more. The, the pigtail post, simple, temporary posts. So we're able to, this allows us to really move fence quickly. So move fence for 30 cows once it's set up, uh, just as fast as I can move fence for 100 cows or 150 cows. It really does not take that long. And it's, it's a lot quicker than 
bring up a tractor and a TMR, and, and we utilize those yet too, so we know exactly how to do it. Uh, but it's so much quicker to do it and efficient uh, than starting all that up and, and running feed out to cows. Uh, we're just using more of these natural type of systems. Uh, so there are cows, you know, back in their paddock. Uh, so we'll use basically a high tensile wire, and that's what that reel is uh, on right now uh, that you can see. And uh, and that, uh, I'm just trying to use a pointer here, but, but that high tensile wire uh, is what most of our areas, uh, so we can break it up by using this, you know, this, this temporary fence here. So I'm having a hard time advancing right now. All right. Having a little bit of technical difficulty advancing the slide. There we go. All right. So another tool that we use uh, are reinforced lanes. And this, this allows us to move cattle efficiently. And so you're not tearing up areas. We don't create these big mud holes and these disturbed areas. So we can actually make a wound lane, move cattle very efficient. It's been another tool uh, that has allowed us to graze a lot better. Uh, No-till drills. So it's where the sods aren't quite as tight, we can use a no-till we'll every year uh, and just intercede varieties of grass legged see the rows uh, where we can see some of these uh, of grasses and uh, and they will and under good thing minute this is a picture of you saw that first pasture where we rented that land where I did that demonstration on cows coming all the way out there through good management, now this is you know 12 years ago, that land has never been tilled. Through good management, this is what those paddocks look like right now. Some interceding, the proper cow pressure, getting cows on, getting them off, um, properly. Looking from the other way, but this is what some of those paddocks look like now. You can see the density in the um, and the type of carrying capacity we have for cows. There's 300 dairy cows in the background there right now uh, grazing and that that farm is able to handle. Uh, the other thing, you know, is because if, if you manage correctly, and this is the thing we need to really look at, and the differences between grazing and real managed grazing, uh, is that a well-rested paddock, you take a look at the root systems that you can gain. Uh, and when you gain that type of root systems, you can, and all of us know here, how that links to drought tolerance, um, how it links to, you know, water retention within soil and water, you know, uptake, uh, but how well it lends to, you know, keeping soil in place. I mean, that will keep soil where it needs to be. It's very difficult to break it away uh, from something like that. So this is just another picture of, you know, managed pasture. This is actually on a second farm. It took us three years is all. We got, and this is actually the fifth year of grazing on the second farm. So this used to be a cornfield uh, where we brought in some more improved grasses uh, and legumes. And this was a white clover year. And I mean, look at the, you know, the pollinator potential uh, that we've got on it through proper grazing management. You know, end of the day, when you get sods that are that tight, and I'm going to show more pictures of it because this is really cool. Uh, when you get sods that tight, that keeps soil where it needs to be. And where soil is kept where it needs to be, you not only increase the actual um, nutrient in the, in the soil profile uh, and the amount of nutrients and the, and the health of that soil, uh, but you keep that phosphorus and that soil where it needs to be, and that's underneath and around the plants. Uh, so when we look at one of the Discovery Farm studies done back a few years ago, uh, this just kind of shows you, uh, you know, the, the amount of soil loss, and sediment loss. Uh, this is actually from an outwintering type of pasture, which is, you know, one of the areas that we really pay attention to um, and is probably the weak point in a lot of these grazing systems. Uh, but very, very little even soil loss, you know, coming out of that type of a of an area, of an outwintered area, uh, where versus if you see a more exposed soil, 
under a cropping type of system or a straight row crop, uh, you're seeing considerably more uh, erosion coming out of it and soil loss. Environmental impacts. This is something that was done. This is a Roth study done, and many of us have maybe seen this too. Impacts of converting to managed grazing on a 250-acre dairy farm in Pennsylvania. And if they convert 75 acres of cropland to perennial grassland, uh, they've seen uh, a reduction in erosion of 24%, and sediment bound soluble phosphorus runoff by 23 and 11% respectively. Convert that whole farm, the whole 250 acres, to perennial grassland, we're reducing erosion by 87%, uh, and soluble P loss is reduced 80 and 23%. Uh, so it, it's really an indicator, and there's one study showing uh, you know, basically what our potential is with retaining soil. Now think about those type of um, statistics and that ability to retain soil in our most sensitive watersheds. Uh, it's very difficult to compare to that. I mean, that is, is about as good as you're going to get. Here's something that was done um, uh, just a, a few years ago down in um, a Fenwood Creek watershed, Marathon County, uh, did these studies. But they basically just took a SNAP uh, program and plugged in the numbers on a typical dairy rotation. And a typical dairy rotation is when you're running a fall moldboard tillage uh, for corn, soybean, uh, and then uh, two years of alfalfa. So we're looking at two years of corn sludge, a year of soybean, and two years of alfalfa, and that type of a rotation. And then we've broken out the phosphorus index for you know, uh, for that type of, uh, those types of systems, and then we've uh, also indicated what the soil loss uh, factor could be in there also. Uh, and as we see it, at the base dairy rotation uh, is, I mean, there is a, a significant phosphorus index, and it's mainly because of the manure that's in that system. Uh, and then through that type of rotation, you know, the index is showing you know, there's a fair amount of soil loss on that too. And then Compare that to the cover crop system, uh, which we are looking at in many cases as a solution, but the cover crop system really doesn't allow a whole lot better. I mean, it, it isn't faring as even even that much better. Increased hay uh, by one year, uh, we're having a little less soil erosion and soil loss than a base dairy rotation. By throwing that extra in there, no-till factors in fairly decently. Uh, chisel plow, you can see the, the type of, uh, uh, of soil loss equation that comes in. Let's just move right down to grazing with an outwintering type of a component. Uh, and there is a bit of a phosphorus index. We wanted to put that in there for the outwintering uh, type of uh, management systems. Uh, and then if we don't outwinter and we've got actual facilities for them throughout that year, uh, we're bringing it right down to almost nothing. Here's a cash grain comparison. Uh, and that, that eliminates the cattle piece of it. And we can just kind of take a look. Our phosphorus indexes aren't quite as high, but our soil loss indexes are right there. Uh, so it's, it's right the same basic uh, type of comparison on this, on this cash grain type of a, of a model, of a model culture. So if anybody has any questions at any time or comments, by all means, go ahead and, and ask or, or write them on here. And I'll take them. So, so this is really what we're looking for. So when we talk about the soil loss, here is, again, some more pictures of what these old sods can turn into. This is another picture of uh, that original field that I showed where we started renting. Um, when, when I try and demonstrate you know, what really this density looks like, it's very hard to do it. And I was walking around one day looking at my feet because I'm introverted. Uh, and I thought, you know, let's take pictures of this, uh, and this might be the best way to do it. So here's another field itself, and you can just see the density uh, and the soil holding capacity uh, within these type of pastures. This is trying to pull the grasses away. This is a, another field, and, and some of these are 18-year-old sods uh, that have not been plowed. You're seeing a fair amount of legume in these also. So when it comes to this, and when you've got this type of a sod, and you've got, here's a two-inch rainfall that came in within an hour and a half. And this is coming off about 200 acres of, of managed pasture that I've got on one of my farms. So these are coming off of my farms. Uh, and that water is clear. I mean, you can't really deny 
how well filtered that is and how little soil is in it. This is going through the ditch coming off of that farm. Conversely, this is one of my fields where I planted corn that year. Uh, and you can see the type of exposure. Um, and uh, I'm going to grab a quick question here too. But, but I, mean, I say you see the type of exposure that is out there. Uh, one more quick slide and I'll get to that. Uh, and here is another uh, section of it. Okay, that's not advanced right So the question is, how many acres of pasture uh, would you recommend for this to be successful in northwest uh, Wisconsin? How many acres per head? You know, I am running on the one farm, I'm running about 1.1 1 .1 and a quarter acre per head. Uh, um, on the home farm, I'm at about two acres per animal. We've seen successful grazing systems where you're getting at that 0.8 acres per animal uh, or per thousand pound unit uh, where people are doing a pretty good job. This is requiring some more supplementation, uh, but depending on what percentage of dry matter you want pulled in per cow, uh, you know that, that can vary uh, just by the land base that you have. Very good, thanks. Um, So moving on, okay, so this is just another picture of, of a cornfield coming in. We've all seen these. Uh, this is another very flat, this is one of my fields also. This is just plain after, you know, some of the winter, the snow runoff on a big snow year. This is a pretty flat field, uh, but you can just see what happens over the years and, you know, how we've eroded so much of that actual topsoil and we're down to that. That's almost the A substrate that we're that we're looking at. Uh, so getting back, this is that same two inches of rain event, uh, and this is where my cows were on one of those original slides. But you can see the cows are still; they're not pugging it up. Uh, when you get that type of a density in soil uh, and density in your pastures, they they are really resilient. They're very resilient to cow traffic and the hoof traffic, uh, and they continue to do their job keeping that soil where it is. Uh, here's another picture just of what I would use as a bit of a cover crop example. So this is the annual uh, sorghum sedan. I don't plant this anymore either. Uh, but this is what we had. So when you look down inside it, you can still see it looks great you know, as you're looking across it, but there's a lot of soil uh, that's exposed. Uh, so you can kind of give an example of what's going to retain it uh, as well. Here's an example of a little bit you know, comparing constant grazing or continuous grazing to a more managed grazing. Uh, and this is something that we run into many cases when we start talking about stream rehab uh, and cattle around streams. Cattle around streams is not a bad thing if they're managed correctly. And in fact, it's a very good thing. It's a healing type of thing. Uh, this is just an area where it's a reinforced uh, crossing and possibly even a watering area, but it's reinforced crossing is what it is. And if you just allow them short accesses, uh, to that stream bank so they can keep that vegetation down, uh, keep the sunlight down in there, uh, and keep it from growing up and silting in. Uh, that is very important, and that's what's going to happen when you come in with a very managed short burst of cow pressure on our streams. And uh, so when you look at this, so here's another bit of an example, uh, and I'm going to read this a little bit, but when fields are grazed, perennial grasses carpet these fields, Rain infiltrates and is retained in soil organic matter. Less soil and phosphorus washes away and enters surface water and streams. So, uh, a, a DNR wildlife, uh, a DNR uh, biologist um, had looked at it in this way, and he's done a lot of this. That Dave Vitrano has done a lot of work down in the Cooley regions on um, basically reinvigorating uh, fresh water and cold water streams and trout streams. Uh, but he looked at it too, and you know, well managed grazing systems, soil erosion. Uh, uh, manure, pesticide, and herbicide runoff is reduced almost to zero. And a well-managed stream bank is very good uh, for that stream and for wildlife. Uh, let's look at wildlife in general and, and birds. So here's just, I just always thought it was a cool picture of a killdeer uh, in one of the fields. Uh, but when we look at uh, birds and wildlife impact, and this is kind of an interesting graph, decline of forage acres in grassland birds. Uh, so if you take a look at, um, you know, over the years from the 1960s, and as you look at forages, the blue line, uh, row crops, 
uh, the green line, and then we're using the western meadowlark as kind of the indicator species uh, on what happened as our number of acres of forages has gone down up through 2000 and our number of acreage, acres of uh, row crops have gone up, uh, the actual population of these birds has significantly uh, declined. Uh, let's take a look at another factor of managed grazing. And this is a study done in 2010. And you know, it, it, it's not ideal to get the exact study you're always looking for. This is an example of one. Uh, but here we're talking about manure nutrient and greenhouse gas values for one lactating cow, plus the supporting animals. And that's going to be their, their calf uh, or you know, the, the young stock herd that's behind them. Uh, so this study just happens to break out um, and talk about the, the greenhouse gas values. Uh, so, and it's going to break out cow management systems that are using uh, RBST, that's becoming less and less uh, popular. Uh, conventional type of a system, this is going to be more of your freestall you know, type of a system, uh, bringing most all the feed to the cow, hauling the manure away. Uh, the organic intensive system, and this used the organic grazing system, so it looks at the organics. But if you take a look uh, at the actual manure per day, this is an interesting study. Total manure per day is 246 pounds on one end of the scale for the RBST, 173 for the organic grazing. Two things there. Uh, is the organic cows, many times they're a little bit smaller. Uh, that is reality. Uh, and, and the RBST cows, it takes a lot of feed to make this kind of milk. Uh, because when you're looking at, you know, there, and we'll throw another uh, graph coming up here, but, but a lot of these will average 30,000 pounds uh, per cow. Uh, but as a result, we're cranking out a lot of manure per day, 240 pounds versus 173 on uh, a grazing type of a herd. Lifetime production of 402,000 pounds, uh, whereas we're looking at 407,000 um, pounds uh, on the grazing herd. But pounds of manure per pound of milk, uh, you know, we're looking at 7.3 pounds of manure per pound of milk, whereas it's 4.8 pounds on this grazing type of system. And then the methane emissions equivalent, uh, a lifetime methane pounds, uh, pounds per day of methane out of the, the one end is 4 pounds 6,600 uh, per lifetime, whereas we're looking at 1.54 and 3,600 per lifetime. Pounds of methane per pound of milk, 0.12 pounds on one end versus 0.04 pounds on the other end. Uh, and, and that's taking in a variety of factors there. So if you take a look at that, that methane end, uh, these managed grazing systems, they're looking pretty good uh, looking at this specific study. Uh, we'll take a look at another, um, and this is a piece of that, you do that factors into it, and that's the longevity. So when you take a look at an animal that is in uh, an RBST type of situation, conventional situation, just the reality of it, you're looking at one to two lactations uh, that they're going to last. Uh, so their rolling herd average typically in um, uh, you know, a, a, a well-run, you know, um, a confined type of an operation uh, is looking at that 30,000 pounds lifetime production. Because we're only looking at about two lactations, 54,000 pounds of milk. Uh, milk per year of life is 12,000 pounds. Uh, let's move all the way down to the other scale. And what we're looking at out of some of these grazing type of systems, we're looking at four and a half lactations per cow. Now, yeah, the rolling herd average may only be 18,000 pounds, 17,000 pounds. But, you know, we're looking at a lifetime herd, you know, milk production of 84,000 pounds of milk, milk uh, per year of life at 13,000. So, you know, from an actual production standpoint, you're not getting it all up front, but per cow, you're getting it. Um, and so it is, from an economical and a milk production standpoint, a very, very competitive. Uh, let's look at it from an economic standpoint. Um, and uh, and for, you know, I'm popping back and forth looking for questions here, uh, if there are any. So, uh, so anyway, from an economic standpoint, and we've gone back to 2009. Uh, 2009 uh, is a lot like what's happening now. Uh, and that's a really depressed type of a milk market. And, and the price of milk, the average price of milk is down low enough. Uh, but back in 2009 when this happened, uh, here's how some of the different dairies had fared. You could take the organic dairies 
uh, and they were still looking, there's only 4% of them, it's, it's higher now. They're looking at a per cow income of $996 per cow uh, income. And this is net income uh, per cow. This isn't gross, this is a net income. Grazing farms, 430. Confinement type of farms, they're losing 145 per cow. Average herd size is 309 uh, cows. Arizona, they're losing 486. That's where they're trucking a lot of feed in. Uh, probably, you know, they get limited water. California, trucking a lot of feed in. Average herd sizes are large. Uh, so they're losing 648. Idaho, 677. This is what they're losing per cow. Now, granted, large, efficient uh, cow systems, these large, efficient dairies, when the price of milk is, is up there a little bit higher, they can make an incredible amount of money. But as soon as it dips down below that cost of production, uh, and that's a real brittle tipping point, they can lose a lot fast. So when we look at big picture what our dairy industry needs to look like, if it's all one-sided or if the whole thing looks like large confinement uh, management systems, we're a very, very brittle dairy industry uh, where it's feast or famine. Uh, in order to basically keep our industry and our support businesses and our structures stable, we need to have a sizable piece of our dairy industry using different management systems. So yes, maybe they aren't maybe they aren't as profitable in some environments or some economic environment. Maybe they are just as profitable, uh, but they're able to weather economic environments. Dairies may not be spending the money with the industry and the resources that you can see, you know, how the components are. So this is the way to keep a really strong dairy and a strong agriculture. It's by diversifying the type of management system that you have, and this graph kind of shows it. The other thing that we're having out there is there is, whether, you know, like it or not, there's a lot of consumers that are looking for a different type of a product, uh, whether it's just because uh, they've read something, because they've got discretionary money, because they want a story associated with their food, there's a lot more interest and there's a huge potential for growth markets in specialty and organic type of dairy products. Let's give it to them uh, if they want it. Uh, let's, let's take advantage of these money-making opportunities and ways to strengthen and diversify our markets uh, and manage grazing and organic dairy fit that mold. Uh, they're able to produce to these type of market systems. Uh, so from an economic standpoint, uh, very important to have them around. This is just another, this is my dad actually bringing calls home from a number of years ago, but I always, it always makes me think that, you know, people talk about this world, you know, feeding the world, um, and can a managed grazing herd or can managed grazing produce enough milk to do it? Uh, can our landscape sustain uh, a significant amount of animals out on the grass? When we look back in the 1800s, when we got here, uh, there were 60 million buffalo that roamed just the Great Plains alone on an unmanaged type of a system. And there were herds of them that could be 50,000 plus. That's what built our Great Plains and built that robust topsoil that we have uh, and did a pretty good job at doing it. So when you think about that basic technology or that basic tool of managed grazing and animals out in real diverse systems um, on dairies, uh, definitely it's doable. Uh, it's, it's a very doable, very natural type of a technology uh, that can solve these problems and solve these issues. So agriculture does have the tools. Uh, it does have the tools to take a look at our water quality and and implement the proper tools and manage grazing uh, to come in and help mitigate and solve some of these water quality issues. Uh, we need to take a serious look at it. We need to be fearless uh, in finding these solutions. Uh, and you know, not that one tool is better than the other, you know, or one management system is better than the other. We need to identify which management systems need to be utilized where uh, and be smart about this. Uh, opportunities that are out there, and this is going to kind of conclude this and, and wrap it up a little bit, but the average age of U.S. dairy farm is 59 years old. Uh, we can look at that as saying, oh my gosh, that's devastating, and it is. Uh, you know, we're losing a lot of farmers. Uh, there's few opportunities for, far, for retiring farmers to sell their cattle and land 
uh, to a beginning farmer just because of the environment that's out there, the land prices, the, the cost to get started into, you know, uh, into farming. Uh, Wisconsin loses 500 of its dairy farms a year, and actually we're underneath 10,000 now. Uh, the average farm loss in the United States, not just a Wisconsin problem, we're 5 to 10% of the average farm loss. Uh, the next generation, I mean, we're going to have hundreds of millions or tens of millions of acres of land that may come up for transition over the next decade or two, um, just with the average age of farmers. Uh, so this is something where we have an opportunity here. You know, we have got a management system and managed grazing and organic uh, that can allow new farmers to come into the business, which will allow us to diversify our industry and strengthen our industry, which will also have the tools, and these type of farmers will have the tools uh, within agriculture to help mitigate some of this soil loss and some of this phosphorus runoff and some of this nitrogen leaching. Uh, so we can take a good portion of this land, we've got the opportunity to do it, to bring the next generation of farmers, of small business people, out in our rural communities. So alongside of that 3,000 cow farm, we can have 100, we can have 30, 100 cow dairies, independent dairies, right alongside them. Independent businesses contributing to the local economies within our rural communities. This is what managed grazing has the ability to do, but the reality to do it is that it takes skilled people to do it. And this is what we'll be talking a little bit more about, and this is something that I'm very passionate about, and a lot of us are, um, about training this next generation, about taking this current situation in dairy and saying this is an opportunity here. This is an opportunity to transition a lot of these farms and a lot of this land to a diversified, a, a different management style, which will diversify and strengthen our dairy industry. Um, and by doing that, or the way we do it, is through skilled people and creating people that understand and are able to, you know, not just take a piece of the farm or not just know nutrition or just know agronomy uh, or know mechanics and maintenance, but to develop a full-blown farmer that is able to manage their cattle, manage their soils, their crops, their buildings, their facilities, and be able to be a complete farmer uh, around managed grazing systems. Uh, and that's what we need to create. And the only way to really do that uh, is to train them underneath people that have done this. So the Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship has been started in Wisconsin about four years ago you know, with the idea, much like the guilds have done for years in this state uh, and in the nation and in the world for as far as that goes, is they've taken a formalized apprenticeship program where they will basically take a skilled labor uh, which will train that next generation, train their apprentice in their trade. And the electricians still do it, the steam fitters, the, the bricklayers, the plumbers. Uh, and we looked at this method of transferring knowledge that you know this is what is going to work uh, to create that next generation of farmers. Uh, so the Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship is a formally registered apprenticeship program uh, for managed grazing and organic. Uh, so we identify masters that have been doing this for at least five years, many have been doing it for 20 years, uh, and we have created a 4,000 hour on-the-job training program that lasts for two years where an employee will work on that farm underneath the guided instruction of their master or employer following a job book, which is a physical book, which basically lists all the competencies that we've identified through a formal DACUM, uh, which is developing a curriculum. It's about a 10-month process that we did with Worldwide Instructional Design Systems. Uh, but this job book contains all of the competencies and work competencies that we've identified uh, that an individual would have to know and comprehend in order to manage, own, or operate their own dairy someday. Uh, so they follow this job book uh, through this two-year on-the-job training. Uh, and then in addition to that on-the-job type of structured training, there's also classroom type of work that goes with it and where they really sit down and learn the 
the whys behind the how-tos. Uh, we teach them about dairy nutrition, milk quality, dairy herd management, farm business management, uh, soil quality, and bring all that together and then also offer uh, a peer-to-peer -peer networking component uh, through discussion groups, through farm tours, uh, through engaging them within our local you know, infrastructure of support people with our extensions, our NRCS offices, our FSA offices, um, you know, um, service providers, you know, uh, agronomist nutritionists uh, that are in the dairy industry. And the idea with this is to create a farmer and give them the support and resources that they need to either start transitioning into the farm that they're maybe working on or apprenticing on or allowing them to start earning equity in their own herd of cows that they can take and lease uh, a farm and begin building equity in cattle and equipment, or they can take it into a direct farm transfer type of situation. Uh, the Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship Program has been very exciting to be involved in it. Uh, it is now registered with the Federal Department of Labor, so it's the only formal apprenticeship program uh, within the nation and now it's nationally registered. So it's truly the farmer's program where they can take it into different states uh, and it is fully accredited by the Federal Department of Labor as a formal apprenticeship program. Uh, so right now uh, we are operating the apprenticeship in, in Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, Missouri, in Maine, uh, New York, and Pennsylvania. Uh, and we're continually looking for you know other partners uh, and, and people to partner with and, and from an administration path standpoint uh, to keep expanding the program where the interest is. Uh, Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship is a 501c3 nonprofit and is primarily grant uh, funded and foundation funded uh, mainly out of uh, the main funding source, the Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Grant, uh, the USDA NIFA uh, that we've applied for uh, and have been able to receive to really develop this program and roll it out uh, onto a national type of a scale. So it is designed to take managed grazing as a tool uh, for water quality for beginning farmers, for taking advantage of these growth value added type of industries for enhancing rural communities. Um, and it's designed to take that tool and train individuals to utilize that tool in dairy farming. Uh, so. That's a little bit about, uh, you know, just our take on managed grazing and its impacts to the dairy industry, uh, the role it can play in water and soil quality, as well as the economic role that it can play within the dairy industry. Uh, and it's just a little bit of a, a precursor and introduction to the dairy grazing apprenticeship, which we'll talk about next month and how we got that started and what the, the mechanics are of it. So. I thank you so much, and uh, I'm open for any questions. Okay, I don't hear any questions coming through. So, well, thanks, Joe. That was great. Um, I appreciate you taking time and doing that and bearing with the technical difficulties on my end. Um, so, thanks, Joe, and we will be having Joe speak again on October 12th at 8.15 about the Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship Program. So we'll hear more in detail about that then. So everyone have a great day and thanks for tuning in. And I just want to mention that this um, training opportunity is provided by the State Interagency Training Committee. So have a great day everyone and see you soon.